Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the FinManiacs.com podcast. I am your host, Louis Sung, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Chad Ronnebaum, and making his triumphant return to the podcasting scene, Ron Caniff, Unsquish the Fish, Finn's broadcaster, whatever you want to call him. He is back, and he's ready to rock and roll. How are you doing, Ron? I'm good, man. I'm good. Thanks for having me on. And how about you, Chad? It's been a while since we did a show. How's life been for you? Hey, the Dolphins made the playoffs, so life's good for me. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about that. We, I think we discussed that in the last show. It's like, oh, my God, they made the wild card for the first time in eight years. Like, what a shocker that was. And that's something we'll get into in dirt later in the show. But I'm just thinking to myself, how did the Dolphins get there? I, I, it's still mind-boggling to me that they actually got this far. It was, it's mind-boggling to me that they made it this far with – all of the stuff that Adam Gase had to coach the team out of, all of the things that they had to deal with, not having the right players, having backups, backups and backups, backups, not having Ryan Tannehill for the past for the last few games, not having the offensive line set the way they were supposed to be, the unicorns as they have been called nowadays. Just it's 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 amazing that they managed to get that far. So now what we're gonna do for this show is we're gonna discuss what it was that we expected before the season started when Gase was hired, Tannenbaum started doing his thing, the draft and all that stuff, what we expected the season to turn out to be, and uh, our thoughts as the season progressed and how our thoughts are now after it was all over and said and done. So I'm going to start with you, Ron, since you are making your return to the Dolphins' Twitter sphere and uh, give us your thoughts on what you thought the season would be before it got started and your initial reaction to what it turned out to be um i figured they would be six and ten honestly that's where i thought they were gonna land um maybe they'd fall around five or four games the way the season started i thought they might win two or three uh but before the season started i thought they were gonna be six and ten uh obviously they had a a nice season i i I hate to be a you know a party pooper but they did only beat one team with a winning record the entire year but You know, you can only play your schedule, and uh, they beat a lot of teams that uh, (laughs) you got to give them credit for because, uh, honestly, this team was down multiple starters most of the season, especially there towards the end, especially in that Pittsburgh game where it really showed itself. Um, Not having Tannehill, not having Rashad Jones, not having several, not having Mike Pouncey. I mean, we saw the running game pretty much disappear except against the Buffalo the second time. After Pouncey left, as you've always said, Lewis, the running game goes through Mike Pouncey, and that was just true. Um, but it was a good season overall. I was excited to see them in the playoffs. I just thought more about – less about them being in the playoffs and more about the way Adam Gase kind of changed the culture quickly. Uh, that was probably the most exciting part for me because if they could get some some more talent on the defensive side of the ball and perhaps not lose so many – starters this time i'm excited for what the future holds for the team under adam gase and uh how about you chad i was looking for probably a team that was going to have a similar uh performance the last few years because i didn't think they had changed that much coming into the season i mean i know they every year you've got draft picks and, and things of that nature but I was expecting them to be around a 500 football team. And, uh, you know, obviously after the start, I was much down. After we had lost those first two games and they just were executing so poorly, I'm like, wow, it's going to be a long year. And uh, I had to give Adam Gase credit for pulling it together. But kind of like I'm ecstatic we made the playoffs. You got to take that when you can get it because there's several teams that it's been a whole lot longer than it had been for the Dolphins that – are waiting to make the playoffs still. And so it, it really got the meter pointing up. And most importantly, I think it got the whole organization from the upper management down to the, you know, the last man on the 53 man roster all behind get Adam Gase. And um, in terms of free agents and, and players and personnel around the league, he has a ton of respect and there's a lot of people that want to play for him. And so I think that'll, that'll be advantageous to the dolphins going forward and, and having a, playoff season really helps that in that regard because everybody has more confidence in Adam Gase Um, with that being said you have to realize that it took a missed Cleveland Browns field goal and an uh, unbelievable um, Andrew Frank's 55 yard field goal in Buffalo to make the playoffs and so if either one of those kicks had went the other way we probably wouldn't have made the playoffs so 
we weren't that far away from what the team had been in the last few years. And so uh, I hope that serves as notice, you know, for the team and stuff, not to be complacent that they still have a long ways to go if they want to be consistently in that postseason at the end of the regular season. And that's the thing that probably a lot of people need to realize that it's fine to celebrate what happened this season, but we cannot get too comfortable, not, not even close because anybody who looks at this, these, this Dolphins team and says, Oh yeah, we're there and we're going to stay here. I said on Twitter many times that, yeah, Miami will be back. And I firmly believe Miami will be back in the playoffs, but it's not going to be a hard, it's not going to be an easy road. We fought through a lot of issues this season when I Ron when I was on your show I had pretty much gone off the emotional deep end and proclaimed to the world that I believe that the Dolphins were going to go one and 16 or one and 15 rather they were only going to win one game and I was beyond furious I was beyond fed up with everything that I was seeing on the football field I just wanted to absolutely punch my hole through a wall because it was just awful watching them play week in and week out. And it was something that I figured, yep, the Dolphins suck again. Here we go again. It's the same old roller coaster ride, different coach, same players, same results. And suddenly, without any any explicable reason, it's just, here come the Miami Dolphins. There, There really was, there really is no way you can explain it. You can't explain any of what happened. You can say, well, Adam Gase coached them into being good. I'm like, how did he do that? You can't give us an option for that. You can't give us a reason. You can say, well, he started focusing on the run game more, which is true. Yes, he did very much do that. And I'm sure that we are all grateful for that because now we got to see that Jay Ajayi can be a star running back in the NFL, and we can always use one of those. But it still lends to the idea that This Dolphins team has a long way to go before we can comfortably say we are a playoff team. The Dolphins got to the playoffs, but are we a playoff team? And by the most general distinction of the word, yes, they are. They made the playoffs, and so they are a playoff team. But they are not playoff caliber. That's probably the difference. We're we're a playoff team, kind of like Lance Bass is an astronaut because he went into space. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> the definition says Lance Bass is an astronaut, but <laughs> he, he ain't Neil Armstrong. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a difference, and it's something that the Dolphins need to keep an eye on as they move forward. And we'll get a little more into the off season um, shortly. But just my my thoughts on the season were are very simple. I'm very happy that they got to where they where they did i was shocked to say the least and i think i can safely say that these dolphins will be able to overcome adversity now me not acknowledging that very um attribute of this team is what got me into a lot of trouble with dolphins fans all over the place because after that awful jets game where ryan fitzpatrick had to throw like four interceptions i don't even remember how many he threw but the point was Fitzpatrick literally gave the game to the Dolphins, and I refuse to give Miami credit for winning that game because of that very reason. Fitzpatrick handed the Dolphins the game on a silver platter and said, here you go, do whatever you want with this. And that is why I couldn't, in good faith, say the Dolphins won that game and they overcame adversity because overcoming adversity would imply that they actually managed to find a way to play well and actually put together a performance enough to say that they managed to beat the team instead of the team beating themselves because the Jets were just as awful as Miami in that game. And that's what makes the difference for me. So later down the line, when the Dolphins started actually doing stuff and they started winning more and started beating teams like Pittsburgh and, and other teams like that, I'm just, now it's like, Oh, hang on a second. We got something going. And um, I just, you reach the point of defeating adversity when you come up with those wins against the 49ers in the last second. And it was because you made the big stop. And it's because you did things to show 
that you can overcome the adversity. You you made the big play when it counted. You weren't handed the play. You weren't the team wasn't just a little more awful than you. You managed to make the play when it counted. That was the difference for me, and that's why I changed my mind about overcoming adversity. I still feel the way I feel about that Jets game, but overall for the team, I'm willing to say Adam Gase has managed to change the culture to the point where this team will overcome adversity and make plays when it counts, which is a incredible relief knowing what the Dolphins have dealt with for the past several seasons where they would just fall flat on their face when the going got tough. So that that gives that fills me with hope for the future. That fills me with hope that this team can come back, but there is a lot to be done before we can even remotely say this Dolphins team is a playoff caliber football team. And it's going to start this off season and it's going to start with a lot of stuff that needs to be done in on the defensive side of the ball. And so uh, with go ahead. I was about to say before you transition to what what we'll talk about here was what will be done. I kind of wanted to to kind of reflect back on a moment in the season that for me was the, my favorite moment. And that was and I'm just going to call it not the Miami Dolphins comeback, but the Ryan Tannehill comeback against the Rams. I I just thought that was for me like when I take back to look back at the season, I'll remember that more than I'll remember anything. Well, give uh, us some background on that, Ron. Tell, tell us about it. Tell the world what you saw and what well, got went through your you, mind. I mean, if you guys remember, obviously we went into a tough situation. I, I, if I remember correctly, we were down a few linemen going against some of the best D linemen in the league. I mean, it was an ugly, muddy field. And nobody could really do anything. And the game just appeared to be over. And then literally Ryan Tannehill just decided uh, to take the team on his back and go and win the game which we'd all been waiting for him to have that moment. And I think it was the first time. I mean, we've seen him come back and go and have drives. But drives are different than I'm going to take this team on my back and I'm just going to will this this team to win on my own. That's totally different. That's the first time, maybe the only time he's ever truly done that. I, I don't know if he'll have more moments like that or not in his career, but it was nice to see because I'm a big Ryan Tannehill fan. I really like him. You guys know that. Obviously, I've been critical of him before, but I really like him. I hate all the flack he gets and the hate he gets from the media, from the local media, from the national media. I just don't think that he gets all the credit he really deserves, even though I know he's not a, a pro bowler, really, but he's a good quarterback, better than people think he is. So it was just nice to see him do that. And it was for me, it was just a special game and a, and a special moment. And I, I, it's just something I'll remember most from, from this past season. Yeah, that's something that needs to be – it, he needs to be given kudos for what he did. Ryan Tannehill went through a lot of growth with Adam Gase, and he turned himself into a quarterback that that you could you could count on pretty much. You could look at Ryan Tannehill and say, "All right, man, I trust you to win this game. Let's go." Because you found a team that f- gave him the support he needed, especially when all five starters were on the field. Like, think about this for a second, just to just to uh, bring this up. You had all five starters on the field for maybe four games this season, the Unicorns. You had Albert, you had Tunsil, you had Pouncey, you had Bushrod, and you had James, all five guys on the field at once. And almost immediately after that, uh, Jay Ajayi starts running rough shot over the entire league. Now, granted, he actually got started when Albert was out, and that was against... I think it started against the Steelers. That was the first game he ran for 200 yards, and I don't think Albert was playing that game. It was actually Pouncey's first time back, I think. The first uh, the first game that uh, he ran for 200 yards? Yeah. I, I thought that was actually against Pittsburgh. I'll have to, uh, I'll have yeah, to look I, it up. I'm pretty sure it was Pittsburgh that he ran at 200 yards against, and then we played Buffalo the next week, and he did 200 yards again. I, I thought that the, the way it went. Yeah, down, he went but... – Two, year, two, two weeks in a row, he ran for 200 yards. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Pittsburgh was the first game that kind of brought him out. I mean, and, nobody saw that coming. And that put him in elite company, by the way. He wound up – he that's with um, uh, Ricky Williams, ironically enough. O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson. One, I don't remember who the other person was. I think it was Earl Campbell. It. Yes, Earl Campbell. You got it. Yeah, the first game was Pittsburgh. If, if you know if if Pouncey was if Pouncey hadn't gotten hurt, I think maybe you wouldn't have seen a whole lot more 200 yard games. But I think you'd have seen Ajayi probably rush for 1500 yards. And mind you, he would have done that at really like 12 games. 
I mean, he he could if he had really started that off and we'd had Pouncey the whole time. I feel like I feel like a guy was on his way to a super special season. But I mean, Pouncey really makes a difference in that line with the run game. And that's that's the thing that people are so willing to dismiss or at least ignore for the sake of getting somebody else. Now, I can understand the want of fixing the offensive line once and for all because you don't trust Mike Pouncey to stay healthy and all that other stuff. I get that. I really do. But here's something to consider. Is it possible, and this is just speculation. I don't know anything about it. I don't have insider knowledge. Is it possible that Pouncey did not play because Gase did not feel comfortable letting him out there and possibly making it worse? Uh, 100%. Because, yeah, I believe that 100%. It's the way Gase has been uh, with injuries in, in this first season. So it's possible we'll see Pouncey come back and he'll be just fine. I mean, there's no guarantee. Like, people were mocking Kiko, and we'll talk about Kiko later. I guarantee you that. But we were mock- people were mocking Kiko Alonso for saying, oh, he's never going to stay healthy. He'll be out by the second game, and he'll, 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 he'll be hurt, and he'll suck, and he'll, all that stuff. We can't make the assumption that this player or this other player will just get hurt, and he won't be able to contribute. Kiko proved that once and for all, I would hope, that – if you live in fear of injury, you're never going to get anywhere because every time a player decides to get hurt or, well, he decides to get hurt. Well, you know what I mean. It's like every time a player gets hurt, you assume he's got to go because he's going to be injury prone and we can't count on him. And then that's just, that's called a revolving door. That's called, it's the Dallas Thomas mentality. Every time a player gets hurt, time to let him go and find somebody else. You're never going to get anywhere with that mentality. Mike Pouncey, I understand he's missed games these past few seasons. I get that. And it's annoying. It is annoying. But this is the first year that he's missed more than four games in his whole career. Just four. His brother, Marquise, went down for pretty much the whole season. He went out in week one back in, I think it was 2013. Yeah. And you would think that that would cause Steelers fans – to call for Marquise's head because, oh, my God, he's a center and he's paid a lot of money and there's so many better options out there. I'm just like, Steelers fans aren't calling for Marquise's head. But for some reason, Dolphins fans want uh, Mike to hit the road. Yeah, I don't don't believe that's fair. But uh, the big thing with Pouncey, what makes me nervous is is this is the second time now he's had a hip issue. I I just hope that it's not going to be something that's – that it's just going to haunt him the rest of his career. And shorten his career. That's what I'm concerned about. I mean, I'm not, I'm not mad at him or think he needs to go because when he's on there, he's phenomenal. He's one of the best centers in the league when he's in the in the on the field and he makes this offensive line work. So I want him in there. I just hope that he really does get fully healthy. And I'm I'm glad Adam Gase held him back, and I'm glad that Adam Gase didn't even think about considering trying to put Tannehill in in the playoff game or anything. I'm glad to see that because we've seen other coaches make mistakes with other players and somewhat similar situations and a lot of times it's it's hurt the player in the long run so there's a lot to think about here so now then now let's go into the the next situation which is what should the dolphins do going into the off season now this is something that i have been saying for uh on twitter for a while and i've always been told that i'm wrong i'm crazy all that nice stuff that everybody loves to spew on the internet it's like Everybody's smarter than everybody else. But anyway, I digress. The Miami Dolphins have them have found themselves in a situation where the best thing to do, in my opinion, is to approach this offseason with the mentality that you have to fill the holes on your roster. Forget, like, like free agency is obviously going to go first. We have to consider what we're going to do there. That's going to be the, that's gonna be step one. But... Depending on what Miami does in free agency, which I would assume is going to revolve around, based on everything Chris Greer has said and Mike Tannenbaum, it is going to revolve around re-signing their own guys, which is actually a, uh, a refreshing change of pace considering what the Dolphins have done over the past few seasons. They will probably re-sign they – will probably, they will most likely extend Jarvis Landry. They might give a new deal to Rashad Jones. I would like to see them do that. 
they want Kenny Stills back, which is incredibly important. And honestly, I think the, the mentality has shifted that Stills is actually the most important piece of the offense. And I'm starting to believe that myself because yeah. without Stills, it doesn't work. I agree. I agree. And uh, I mean, if, if nothing I was more wrong on or player I was more wrong on heading into the season as the way it ended up was Kenny Stills, that's for sure. And so with that mentality, you have to assume that Stills is going to get himself a pretty um, lucrative contract, which he does deserve. You're going to find him. You're going to find himself in a situation where um, you may have to wind up paying him nine, 10 million a year annually. You might have to give Jarvis something along those lines. So salary cap is going to get eaten up. There's no doubt about that. So Miami's going to have to be careful about free agency because in order to re-sign their own guys, they're going to have to be very careful. We can hope, we can pray that the Adam Gase effect kicks in and they say, well, we want to play anyway. And they'll take like discounts and stuff, but I'm not so sure about that. But we can't count on that. We have to assume that they're going to want as much money as they possibly can. Jarvis, yeah. I wrote a story based on his um, Instagram and his Twitter uh, posts of, in uh, like a week or so ago where he's like, don't mess with my money this year, which is his way of saying, hey, Miami, we need to talk because he's he's been the best player on offense for quite some time, and he's been getting paid peanuts. Yeah, yeah, definitely. He's somebody that they're going to have to uh, to look at trying because you just want to make him happy, and you don't want – you know, he's not going to want to play – on this, I mean, he doesn't really have a choice because he's not a free agent. And knowing him, he's going to play hard. But I'd like to see them go ahead and wrap that up. Uh, Rashad Jones, on the other hand, I mean, he's already, if you look at it, he's already one of the highest played players on the team. And he's already one of the highest paid safeties in the league, uh, strong safeties anyway. So I know he does a lot for the team, but I just don't know how much higher you really can go with him. Maybe it's more of an extension thing, maybe some more guaranteed money. I don't know about right. really upping that yearly deal. Not that the yearly even matters much for these players. It's really about the guaranteed money. So I think I think for him, it's more about that guaranteed money. Uh, That's but, all Rashad cares about. He wants he wants insurance. That's what he wants. He wants insurance. But what's he, what's it going to cost to keep Stills? Fifty million, fifty-five million. Well, I, again, it's really down to the guaranteed cash. I don't think this is what I this is what I speculated. I don't even know if contracts will work this way. I speculated that if you give a player a lot of guaranteed cash, then they will be willing to take a little less annually because all they care about is how much am I going to make for sure. Mm -hmm. I thought this about Jarvis. We can count on Jarvis. We're not worried about him getting hurt. He's, I don't think he's ever been hurt. I don't think he's ever missed games. I, I may have to, I'll have to look that up, but I don't think he's ever missed any games. He's been, he's been reliable. He's been somebody we can count on. He's a fan favorite. He's the face of the franchise, pretty much. We can count on him to make the play when we need the play. He's always on fire. He's always giving everything he's got and then some. And you see that, and you see this, what, the, what kind of money he's going to be expecting. And by the way, yes, he has never missed a game. And he's now he's gotten two straight 1,000-yard seasons, whether that's because he just happens to catch a lot of passes, which he does. I understand that. He's a Ryan Tannehill favorite target, which is fine. But His average went up this year, though. I mean, he's at, he's at 12 yards a catch which is, you know, getting a little bit better than where he was. Yeah, that's because Tannehill's taking more shots downfield, but anyway. Well, yeah, it's because the whole offense changed under Adam Gase. It just was a different offense. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, if, I, if I'm the Dolphins, I am willing to give Jarvis more guaranteed money than maybe usual if, if it'll mean that his overall cap hit for, how, for the length of his contract will go down. Because guaranteed money is a very dangerous game for agents and teams and and players. Because if you don't get a good amount of guaranteed money, then if something goes wrong, you don't get paid. And every all they care about is, am I going to be getting a good amount of money even if I go down or if I'm going to get released? That's all they care about. That's why everybody says it's all about the guaranteed money. Because that's the money you get paid regardless of what the team decides to do with you. 
Miami's not getting rid of Jarvis. There is no way that Jarvis is going to go elsewhere unless Miami just lets him walk and they feel like he's not worth it. They're not going to release him. They're not going to – unless Jarvis retires, there's no way he's going to get he's, – they're going to – He's going to be off the team. And I have no qualms with the thought that he might get injured. Even if he does get injured, I'm still going to count on him, and I'm still going to expect him to come back stronger than ever because that's just who he is. But he's never given any indication that we can't count on him. So I would give Jarvis more guaranteed money for the sake of a little lower cap hit every year because I can I trust Jarvis to stay there. I trust Jarvis to do his thing. So – if it means that he'll take a less annual salary and less cap hit, give him all the guaranteed money he wants. It's not like he hasn't earned it. Yeah, well, I mean, that's uh, I, we got the right guy, in my opinion, in the office to work these kind of deals and figure out the money and figure out what to do, what with some of these bigger salaries and how to sign the guys you want to sign. Like, if anybody can figure that kind of stuff out and be creative. Uh, Tannenbaum can be very creative with those things. Uh, as we'll talk about more about the draft here in a little bit, I'm less confident about his ability in that arena. But I'm a confident that he'll figure out and he'll sign who he wants to sign and figure out how to make the money work and figure out how to make the salary cap work. I kind of, I kind of feel like that's just one of his strengths. And he'll pull off some nifty kind of things like, for instance, the trade for Kiko and Maxwell that – uh, landing as Tunzel was just definitely a big bonus. I'm sure he didn't think that at the time. Hmm. But uh, I, I feel confident that whatever they want to do, they'll make happen. So if they don't make something happen, it's either that they really couldn't or they didn't really want to. But if they truly want to, I, I feel like they're going to have enough salary cap to work these guys, to, to get keep the guys they want to keep, and to sign or extend the guys they want to sign or extend. You still there, Chad? Yep, I'm just listening to you guys. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering, you're really quiet over there, Chad. No, I'm just listening, listening to what you guys have to say. So I obviously have my opinions, but I, I can, whenever you guys want me to chime in, go for it. Come on, man, you know how <laughs> yeah, it works. Everybody yeah. wants to speak up, speak up. It's a well, I mean, you're, you're, if you were talking about the receiver situation, um, I think they will resign Kenny Stills. I, I think Kenny Stills wants to stay, and the team wants him to stay. And I think... Um, from a continuity standpoint, the Dolphins have a pretty good uh, trio right now with Devontae, Parker, Kenny Stills, and Jarvis Landry together with Tannehill. I think in, in the league, that's something that gets overlooked is it just takes time for the receivers working with the quarterbacks for it to benefit all those all the guys involved. So the team wants to keep them together, and I think the players want to stay together, and so that will help. Um, in terms of Kenny Stills, um, I don't think you're – I think you guys, your numbers are way too high on what you'll pay Kenny Stills because, uh, to me, Kenny Stills is probably going to be paid in the ballpark of where Rashad Matthews was. And his stats are actually almost comparable to Rashad Matthews. Matthews had the same number of touchdowns this year. He had about the same number of yards. And um, I would say – I think Rashad Matthews got around a, a three-year, $15 million contract or five or six. So I, I would anticipate Miami will probably offer Kenny Stills in a in the range of a three- to four-year deal around five to $6 million a season with a high guarantee on it because he's young. And so usually if a player is younger and he doesn't have any significant injury history, teams are more willing to put more guaranteed money into them because it's more likely they're going to – complete the entirety of their contract so if you're asking me what i would offer kenny stills i'd probably offer him somewhere around uh somewhere around 20 to somewhere between 20 25 maybe a million dollars over four or five years with a uh, decent size signing bonus of it up front and a guarantee on it and i think he would probably go for that uh jarvis landry is much more complicated because he has another year on his contract and it all comes down to what jarvis landry is wanting and so uh if you were asking me a comparable contract player i would look at to if i were going to sign jarvis landry before this coming season i would probably say somebody like maybe emmanuel sanders or jeremy macklin uh, those guys got somewhere in that 40 50 million dollar over four or five year range um if Jarvis Landry is wanting more than that, and he's wanting to be paid like guys like AJ Green, Des Bryant, I wouldn't give give him that deal. I would just let him go through this year because you actually get another year 
if he's not budging off wanting like top 10 receiver money because you can just franchise tag him next year and actually have him for two more years yet. And so um, if you sign players before their contracts are up and they have like Jarvis's contract where it's paying him peanuts, you know, you, you got to understand he's playing a very dangerous sport and there's nothing preventing Jarvis Landry from getting his knee tore up next year and not being somebody you would want to give that kind of contract to. And so it's in Jarvis Landry's best interest to take somewhat of a discount in my mind, maybe take a contract in the range of a uh, Emmanuel Sanders, where it's like maybe a $40 million contract over four to five years, you know, making him a, a top paid wide receiver, but not crazy money. Um, and in return for Jarvis Landry, he's getting that guarantee of getting that money, you know, for his life, rest of his life and uh, not risking having to go through one more year in a very dangerous sport where he could get an injury that could prevent him from ever getting that kind of money. And so it's kind of a trade-off where Jarvis is going to have to give a discount for the year Miami's not getting that cheap contract, but Miami's not going to get him to, you know, sign a ridiculously cheap contract either because I think Jarvis Landry would be much more valuable on the open market than Kenny Stills. And I'm not trying to slight Kenny Stills. He had a good year, but in my mind, Jarvis Landry's a top two or three uh, slot receiver in the NFL and any team in the NFL would want to get Jarvis Landry. Whereas they'll look at Kenny Stills as a guy that he's good, but he's not a receiver that just dominates football games like the top guys in the league do. And so I'm guessing as the off season plays out, if, depends on how agreeable Kenny Stills is, but they may have to let Kenny Stills visit some other teams and shop a little bit because I don't think the league's going to put a premium on him just because he doesn't have uh, big stats. He never has had big stats, and this was a good year for him to have a, a decent year, but I don't think he's viewed around the league as a guy you want to put a ton of money into. Um, so that's my, my take on the receivers, but – uh, prediction wise, I think they'll, both those guys will end up staying in Miami and I think they'll work it. I don't I don't see Landry expecting to get paid like AJ Green or something, especially when he's got a year remaining. I think he'll be more than happy to try to get a four or five year deal where they can get, give him a nice guarantee and a nice big upfront bonus. The same as Kenny Stills, because both those guys are young. And I, I would think from a, a plan standpoint, the team sees both players being in, in the, on the team for the next four or five years. So it's easy to give them four or five year high guaranteed contracts. All right. Well, here's the thing with Jarvis Landry. He's not going to, I don't think he's going to expect AJ green money because obviously he's not, I think he knows he's not AJ green. He's not this guy. He's not Des. He's not those kind of players. He's not that kind of player, but he is going to be expecting a significant chunk. And I think that's when we have to kind of look into other comparable players and what they got on the open market. Like for Jarvis, we have to look at somebody like a Doug Baldwin with the Seahawks. He's also considered primarily a slot receiver. He's considered one of the best in the business at what he does. And he signed this, this season. This, this season was the first year. He signed a four-year, forty-six million dollar contract. That's twenty-four million two hundred fifty thousand guaranteed, and it's an average salary of eleven and a half million. Right, but here's here's the one difference, though, Lewis, is Doug Baldwin signed that when he was a free agent, and Jarvis Landry is not a free agent, and so you've got to offset that if Jarvis Landry wants paid now, before he plays out the final year of his contract, you 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 got to do that at a discount because if he wants paid like Doug Baldwin if I'm the Dolphins I'm like we can pay him like Doug Baldwin next year because they have the power to tag him and so he can't really go much higher than those guys because if he wants paid like a top receiver well you're already guaranteed to be able to pay that without guaranteeing the money and keep him for another year and so I think Doug Baldwin type contract if if I'm offering him that I'm like well we'll give you a, you know a, a contract in that range but I'd probably want to give it at a slight discount than what those guys are getting because Jarvis Landry gets that benefit of not having to play that year. I mean, it's it's a huge benefit to the Dolphins if they don't, you know, sign him this year to get him to that extra year where they keep all that salary cap space to vest in another player right now. And so uh, Jarvis is going to have to take a little bit of a discount if he wants Miami to basically wipe that last year of that cheap money, you know, off the off the season, if that makes sense. Well, um, just for the record, franchise tags, when you sign a player to a franchise tag, their contract is fully guaranteed. For one yes. year. 
for yeah, that one year. year. Yeah, for the one year. You, they, those most of those players don't want a one year guarantee. They want like he wants somebody like Jarvis Landry would like Miami to guarantee him like thirty to forty million over the course of a contract versus try to lock in a guaranteed. You know what would I don't know what it'd be it'd probably be like fifteen million. I don't know what that would be, but yeah, it's something like that, like fourteen <laughs> fifteen million. That, that's receiver. all he's going to get guaranteed for a year. And so that, that again, now you're risking getting hurt. Or you, you, even if you don't get hurt and you just have a bad year, you want to get the big contracts when you can. And so I, if I'm Jarvis Landry, it, it just depends what his priorities are. I mean, somebody like Rashad Jones obviously would be like, no, I want the absolute most money I can get. Whereas somebody like Jarvis Landry might say, hey, look, I have it. Jarvis Landry has not made that much money. Like, to you and me, he's made a lot of money. But in terms of professional athletes, he hasn't because he's been playing on a rookie contract. And so that that's a huge decision if, again, keeping in mind how dangerous football is as a sport. It, you can blow your knee out. I mean, look at Teddy Bridgewater. Uh, that can happen to anybody. And so he he's that's a huge, huge risk for Jarvis to take to play a full year under his current contract. Because if he does have an injury like that, he never gets that big money. And so if I'm him, I it, it would be pretty attractive to me to say, you know what, I, I don't have to be paid top 10 wide receiver money. But if you guarantee me right now 30 to $40 million, it's worth it for me because that sets me for life with, you know, 30 or $40 million. And so that's what the mindset has to be for a guy like Jarvis Landry. It's like I, I can get paid a whole lot of money right now. And Miami has to be willing to do that. If if Jarvis Landry will take, you know, say a 10 to 20 percent discount over what he is on the market right now, if he were a free agent, Miami's got to be willing to pay him that because he has earned that and they got to lock him up. If Jarvis Landry is not willing to give them any discount, I don't know why they would want to wait, why they'd want to sign him in advance rather than just wait and sign him for a premium next year. Well, the other fo- the other shoe is that if Miami waits and he has another crazy year he's going to want even more than he would get if he does but then you have the power to franchise take him so they, they basically could keep him for two more years if they want and so because if he if he is a just an unbelievable year and he is going to get top five to ten wide receiver money on the open market then you can justify paying him a one year guaranteed that rate again on the on the contract. So, I mean, I think what everybody wants Jarvis Landry, the Dolphins, and the fans is for him to sign a four or five year deal before the season starts. So he's just guaranteed to be with the Dolphins. And so again, I think as long as Jarvis is willing to take a, a little bit of a discount, at least like ten to fifteen percent over what he would get on the open market, then I think it works for everybody. He he gets to save that risk of going through another year without getting paid that big contract and. It just gets it taken care of because it, it, you see it over and over. Teams that wait too long, they get burned, and this that's definitely <laughs> Kirk Cousins. Case. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, they didn't want to pay him because they just didn't know, you know. And you know, it's interesting. Kirk Cousins, he made the the right choice as a player, and the Redskins made the wrong choice. But yet, yeah. So look at a team like Houston, and look at the decision they made to pay Brock Osweiler, and you know that's probably going to bite them unless he suddenly becomes good. <laughs> That's that's a tough call, but again, I I just think Jarvis Landry's happy. I think he wants to be in Miami, and I think he will, as long as they give him a, a nice solid contract that makes him, I, I would say right around um, right around forty million. You give that guy around ten million a year and guarantee, you know, fifty at least fifty percent of that or more. I think he'll do it. Um, it, it's in his best interest to not to not risk getting hurt and losing all that money just to try to wait another year to make an extra five or ten million. I just don't see it being worth it for him. It, the only thing that we have to consider in this is, I, I mean, players when the when they first signed the CBA, they were so excited about this franchise tag. Then they realized, wait a minute, this franchise tag is just no good. <laughs> we don't want it. But the the teams a lot of times don't want to franchise tag players either because. They hate eating fifteen million guaranteed to one player. They like to be able to bounce money around, throw it to the future, yeah, you know, things like they hate doing that. And especially with the Dolphins, you got to consider at that point, if you do re-sign Kenny Stills, you're going to be paying him more than you're paying him now. You've got the Tannehill contract that's been kind of put off. We're going to start getting big hit on that. We're going to start getting huge hit off of the Sioux contract. They, I mean, Jarvis is Landry, uh, Landry's agent. I mean, they're looking at those things, and, and they're realizing, man, if they wait one year and try and franchise tag me, it's really going to hurt them to do that. 
So they may kind of play that as a bargaining chip a little bit because trying to find franchise tag in 2018 with, with the way those salaries are working right now, I, I don't, I mean, it's not saying they couldn't do it, but they may have to give up some stuff to, to tag him and, and pay him guaranteed 15 million more on top of all those big salaries they've already got going on. And here's the other thing to consider with the whole Landry situation specifically, Chad, I see where you're going, but, before but I'm, before I continue, I want to ask you this. Do you think it would be fair for the team to treat Landry that way? Serious no, question. I, I, I'm saying that's, that's how I would treat him is I would give him a, a big contract like that around $10 million a year. But, as as, but, but after he plays out his rookie deal? No, no, I would do that right now. Oh, I'm okay. saying if he that, – that's placing him right around, like, I don't know, the top – at the bottom of the top 10. Just a receivers. little under Baldwin. Yeah, I, I would pay him that right now, early. If he's not wanting that, if he's wanting to be paid like Des Bryant or Julio Jones or A.J. Green, I would not pay him that right now because that's what he's – that that's like elite wide receiver money, and you can pay him that next year, you know. And so he has to have an unbelievable year, not get hurt, and then you're just paying him what he's worth then versus paying it to him early. If he's willing to take, you know uh, – right around that range, a, a Keenan Allen, Doug Baldwin, Emmanuel Sanders type contract where he's making around 10 million a year. And you, you can sign that over a four to five years. I absolutely would do that. Now, he has earned that contract. That's a, that's a, it's a big contract for a receiver. It's a big contract for him for his, the rest of his life. And I think it's a fair offer for him. What I don't think they should do is not offer him a contract and just try to eke out an extra year at cheap money. That's what I wouldn't do because I think that leaves a bad taste in everybody's mouth. I think they got to make him that offer that is that $40 million contract. And if Jarvis refuses to play for that or doesn't want to take it now and he wants to risk going for one more year, that's fine. But at least you weren't insulting him or not showing him he didn't matter that you tried to pay him a good contract right now. And it's up to him whether he wants to take it or not. Okay. Cause that's where I was about to go with it because, um, the 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 whole face of the franchise thing is more um, significant than just in the eyes of the fans. Jarvis is the Jarvis and Pouncey are the two alpha males in that locker room. Like we can talk about Tannehill being quarterback and leader all you want. The alpha males, as they're called, are Jarvis and Pouncey. If if the if Miami doesn't treat Pou- um, Landry with respect. And they don't give him what he's looking for or or at least offer him a, a very, very respectable deal. If they try to shortchange him, that's A, going to piss off Landry. That's going to piss off the other players who are also going to be up for new contracts that Miami needs to keep an eye on. Because when the front office plays hardball, that's when players take notice. And depending on what Miami is approach with with Landry – it's probably going to affect the rest of the offseason and possibly future offseasons with all the players on the roster. Because if Tannenbaum gives Landry a crap deal in the eyes of Landry, like never mind what we think, if it's, a, if it's not a good deal in Landry's eyes, then as the leader, even if he doesn't say anything, even if he doesn't react to it, the rest of the players are going to notice and they're going to be like, well, hang on a second. They're not being fair. So what happens when it's my turn? I don't want to deal with it. You're either going to have to pay me big or I'm out of here. And they will gladly go elsewhere just for the simple matter of, I don't want to be in Miami. These guys are cheapskates. So that's a very, very dangerous game to play. If Landry doesn't sign whatever deal he gets. Yeah, I I, I get it to me. That's just making him a, I mean, I can read some names off it and you just, you got to be real on, what a player is and so right now here are the i just pulled up the receiver contracts and here are the top receivers that are paid the, the ridiculously big contracts so you got aj green who's getting about 15 million a year julio jones 14 million all sean jeffries did because he did a franchise tag um demarius thomas des bryant Th- those guys that jarvis Landry cannot do what those players can do no as and much, i don't think he's expecting I, like, that Right, yeah, and the, so those are touchdown uh, catchers. And yeah, those are guys that you catchers. you have to double cover for the majority of the game. They're just that good, and that that's not what Jarvis Landry is. And so, if he is expecting that kind of a deal, then no, you, you can't do it. But no, I don't think he is. 
now you get into guys like Doug Baldwin's got a $46 million deal. Keenan Allen's got a $45 million deal. Uh, Emmanuel Sanders is 33, but he's, his has a higher guarantee. And he's um, older. Tav- yeah, Tavon Austin's $42 million. Um, Jordy Nelson's $40 million. And so, to me, now you're getting into players that are more what Jarvis Landry is, you know, in the league. If he, I would say Jordy Nelson and Jarvis Landry are – not the same type of player, but they're comparable players value-wise probably for what you're getting. They're they're good receivers that make plays. And so that's why I say I go to him. I offer him somewhere around 40 to $45 million with at least half of it guaranteed. If, if they make him that offer, to me, that's a respectful offer to make Jarvis Landry because you're paying him what he's worth in the market, and he can sign that right now and not have to play the rookie contract cheaper. If he balks and doesn't want to do that, then I think as a front office, you just got to wait because he, he's probably not going to jump up on anybody's radar to be at AJ Green, Julio Jones, Des Bryant type money on any team. And so you just have to wait. It, it just, I have no idea what Jarvis Landry or where he's at from a standpoint of what he thinks he should be paid. But I don't know for anybody if, you know, I don't know what Jarvis Landry's made over the course of his current contract. I'm, you know, maybe like 4 million or 5 million or something like that. But that's that's a hard thing to turn out when somebody looks says, look, I will give you a forty five million dollar contract. I'll give you fifteen million of it right now with a check, and I'll guarantee another twenty million dollars of that. I mean, that that's a hard thing in your whole lifetime to turn down and say, no, you know what? I'm just going to go play this year. And especially how Jarvis Landry plays, it, if he blows his knee out, that money's gone. He'll never get that. And so um, that to me, that's again, that's what I said. That makes sense for everybody. It's letting the Dolphins get him locked up at a reasonable, you know, rate what he's worth, and it's allowing him to get that big contract he wants, and it's it's fair for everybody. Yeah, that's that. It's it's a dangerous game the Miami's going to wind up playing because they're not going to have like there's going to be cap space, but depending on how Miami uses it, they're going to run into a lot of trouble down the line. So they have to be very careful how they play this game. Yeah, it. I mean, it, it. This is a year, and I agree completely with what you said early on in the topic, Lewis. Is I don't think Miami needs to go out and sign a bunch of people, and I don't think they need to, quote unquote, cut players that they feel like are are not the right value for their contract. There, there's players I think it is time to part ways with, uh, like somebody like Koamisi, for example. Obviously, uh, yeah. Mario Williams, just because those guys. <laughs> They just aren't on the field. Are they? They're just not reliable players. But there's players I don't agree with that I see a lot of people saying, we, well, we need to get rid of these guys because we can save so much salary cap space. And those players are like Mike Pouncey and Brandon Alberts. And, and I look at it and I'm just like, what are you, who are you going to bring in in free agency that's better than Brandon Albert and Mike Pouncey? And I just I don't think you're going to get those guys out there. Yes, you could go out and probably find a younger guy to, that could be a left tackle and, and give them – in Brandon, That's but you already have that guy in Tunsil. But so it's just, a left guard. You know, one of the biggest reasons the Dolphins have been mediocre over the years has been they've never they they always end up inevitably losing their ta- one of their tackles, and they have an, a guy playing tackle that has no business even starting in the NFL. And so I go into this year and I'm like, you know what? I'm completely fine keeping Brandon Alberts at left tackle, keeping Tunsil at left guard, and keeping Pouncey at center. What I think they need to do is just draft a really good interior lineman that can play guard or center. And that guy then can compete for guard and he can also play center. So now you have your backup plan ready. If Brandon Alberts does break down, you just shift Tunsil out to your left tackle and you have your new rookie who's a a good interior lineman to play guard. If Pouncey gets hurt, that guy, your new rookie interior lineman just takes over for Pouncey. To me, that's the way they build this team. You don't say, you know what, we're going to cut Pouncey and Albert out of this and take all that free agent money because I just don't think you're going to get better players anyway. And you just got to say, you know what, we need to add young guys to them and realize that there's a pretty good chance Mike Pouncey won't be able to go every game next year. There's a pretty good chance Brandon Albert won't be able to go every game next year. But I would much rather have Brandon Alberts, you know, and Mike Pouncey on that team to play what they can versus trying to start over and scratch in free agency. I agree with that 100%. I, this is what, this is what I was saying on Twitter. And this is when everybody was telling me that I'm an idiot, which I guess I'm kind of used to at this point, but anyway, um, the dolphins have something going on the offensive line. They do. They really do. And Bushrod, I don't think is going to want to leave. So he's actually a cheap return. 
Bushrod knows he's not a star. Bushrod knows he's not getting a big payday. I'm sure Adam Gase and he are friends, and he's going to be like, all right, Germ- okay, German, what do, you, what do you want? What can I do to keep you here? And it's like, okay, well, I can do this. Like, okay, we're good. Right guard, Bushrod wasn't awful. I said this, like, people were so mad at German Bushrod for doing this and that and all that other stuff, but he started every game for a reason. Bushrod was good where he was if anything the weak link on the line was Jawan james and i think he just needs to get like refocused because that was a disaster and he wasn't a disaster early in his career and it's not like he's been injured for him to lose talent he just needs to get his head in the game so that's the only thing with Jawan james pouncey is a concern but i'm not again i'm not overly concerned about it because He's had a lot of time to heal already, and he's going to have a full offseason, and Adam Gase is very careful about how he uses his players, and and there's so many other factors, plus the fact that you can't even really get rid of Pouncey, so you're going to have to be stuck with him regardless because cutting him is not going to be very financially um, um, viable right now. It's not a good idea, just salary cap-wise. You kind of have to keep him for a little while longer. So you keep Pouncey, who, by the way, runs the running game, it's, it's through Pouncey that the Ajayi manages to get things done. When Pouncey went down, Ajayi lost a lot of momentum, and it was obvious that that happened. Tunsil stays a left guard for a little while longer. He's not going to forget how to play left tackle. Albert was okay. He wasn't great, but he was okay, and he's a leader on the line, and he knows what he's doing, at least and from a mental standpoint. And actually, he looked better this year than he did a couple of years ago when he was still recovering from that other injury. And mind you, Albert got hurt this year and stayed in anyway because that's just how tough he is. He got in there and he still did his job. So kudos to Brandon Albert. The offensive line is when they are healthy, they're set. They're set. It's good. We saw what happens when all five guys are there. It's amazing the difference. You just kind of have to hope that it happens. They're not gonna. We're not gonna lose Pouncey for. 12 games this year. I really next year. I don't think that. I don't think that at all. And you saw Albert manage to play for I think he only missed like two games, maybe not even that. Tunsil missed one game. Bushrod played all 16. James played all 16. So it was really only a matter of Pouncey was gone and we lost Albert for a couple of games. So Yeah, I agree. And and to go with that, Lewis, you gotta look at the other side of the ball. Miami absolutely has to add uh, help at linebacker and they've got to add a young player at defensive end and so if, if you're going to do that in the offseason you can't create more holes by getting rid of some of your offensive linemen that need to be replaced so i mean that you can you only have so much dollars that you can get people in free agency with and you only have so many draft picks and so i think in the past this team has tended to oh, I don't think Brandon Albert's worth what he's getting paid for in a contract. I, I don't care if he's, he's worth it or not. Keep him here because he's decent and don't create another hole just because you think you can go get somebody else that's a better value, quote unquote. You yeah, and I, don't, I don't think they'll do that either, Chad, honestly. I don't, I don't oh, think no, I don't either, this year right. they'll do that. I, don't, I think they'll be smart about it. Yeah, I, I agree. And so I, that's, I, I think, Lewis, you're right on the head. I think they're going to – Focus on getting Stills back here. I think they'll focus on getting Kiko Alonso back. Well, that's not going to be hard. He's not going to get that much as a restricted guy unless Miami decides to treat him like an actual player and give him a good deal. I, I think Miami needs to get him in, get him a four-year deal, and, and you don't, you don't, he doesn't need to be paid like the, the best linebacker in the league, but they're going to need to pay him a decent contract. But get him locked up because whether he plays inside or outside, again, he's a good football player. And so – that that's how you get a good team is you just keep adding good football players and don't let you know, don't let that's not this team has done of way too much of we've seen way too many dolphins leave the building who go on to have good careers with other teams and it's just because teams are all, you know they just are you can't cut corners all the time and just let guys go thinking well we can just sign this other guy in free agency so i whether kiko plays inside outside I think he's a good football player, and if you just add another linebacker to put with him, it just gives you options. He's a guy you can move around. You know, he can play middle linebacker in one formation, then suddenly you can move him around, you know, in a different call on defense, and he can move to the outside. So that's – he's exactly the kind of player they want to keep around. And the one thing I don't – I think we don't want to forget, though, when you have Steven Ross and Tannenbaum, even with them really trying to focus on keeping the guys we want to keep, let's say we get everybody and extend everybody we want – Somewhere along the way, those guys are going to try and pull off something 
snazzy or big. They just can't help themselves. <laughs> so d- let's just hope that's in addition to being smart with the things we've been talking about. Well, they said – Tannenbaum and Greer both admitted that they are looking into all possible avenues of improving the team. That includes, of course, making trades. Trades, yeah. I think that you could see some kind of maybe trade ha- happening coming. Like something's going to happen that's going to be like, oh, a heck yeah moment. It's just the question is really – I just hope it's on the defensive side. At, at, like at linebacker or, like you said, a younger defensive end, something to that effect. And, and that on the draft end that they really focus on the defense as well. Can't, remember last year, Lewis, we were talking about how this, the 20, uh, I guess you would have called it 2016 draft, needed to be so defensive focused and they didn't really do that. And it showed this season because they don't really have enough young talent on that defense right now. So this year they have to do that or, or they're just going to put themselves in such a big hole on that side of the ball. Yeah, it is. I mean, they're going to make some – I just hope they make the good moves. I mean, I I know they paid him an unbelievable amount of money to get Sue, but Nadalin can Sue is really good. Yeah. Um, You just hope that when they make a a splash move like that, they don't do another Mike Wallace move that, you know, that's where you you really get hurt. And so I don't think they're going to go after uh, the number one free agent this year. I I wouldn't be shocked at all, though, to see Tannenbaum do something like – trade some picks and try to move way up in the draft to get somebody that that would be a hit tantamount type of move. if it's Reuben Foster I'm all for it I don't care what he does well I'm just saying that's, <laughs> what, be, that's the kind of really stuff he'll nice. do he'll he'll trade like your second and fourth round pick away with your first round pick to try to jump up and so to get somebody so I, that wouldn't shock me but you know keep in mind um I know Tannenbaum's a little – he likes to be kind of a wheeler dealer, but I still think this team, especially after this year and making the playoffs, this team is now Adam Gase's team. And so nobody in this organization is going to trump Adam Gase. Um, Steven Ross completely is giving all support to Adam Gase. And so this draft, I, I think he's going to have a huge amount of – of say on who gets picked and who he wants. And I, Adam Gase is going to want some more toys on offense. They're going to get one way or another. Miami is going to get a very athletic tight end. I guarantee Adam Gase wants that. And you're going to see it happen. And, and as good as a year is a Jai had, don't be shocked at all to see Miami bring in another really talented running back. I know, uh, uh, Ken, Kenyon Drake has some potential, and, and I, I like Jay Ajahi's hard running style, but it wouldn't shock me at all to see Adam Gay say, you know what, I also want Christian McCaffrey in this mix. You know, it's not somebody, anybody would say, I see that coming. But just keep in mind, Adam Gase is going to want a few more toys on offense. Well, I mean, I won't begrudge him for wanting toys. I'm just hoping that he also realizes that, hey, <laughs> this defense sucks. And you, like you just hired Matt Burke because he happens to know Joseph's scheme. And he also learned a lot from Jim Washburn, who also ran the wide nine at, as his, when his, with his thing. So it, he, I hope that he has the wherewithal to say, okay, hang on. Let me make sure that this defense has the necessary players, that he has the resources to do what needs to be done. Because if you ignore the defense in favor of offense, I know that Gase is an offensive-minded coach. I get that. But I would hope that after seeing what the offense can do, that he realizes it's time to fix something else because the defense was a disaster. And I don't think that anybody with eyes, and if we really believe that Gase is smart and hashtag in Gase we trust, then he's going to realize Burke needs some players to play with because this is not going to work. So I, oh, no, I, I agree with you on that. I, I don't disagree. I'm just uh, saying that, that Adam Gase will have some say, but I, I, I don't think anybody in the organization doesn't realize they need to get more talent at linebacker and they need to get some youth on the defensive line. I mean, even tackle, I know that we've got Phillips in there with Sue, but they could use another really good D tackle. And so it, it wouldn't disappoint me at all to see the team take a, any defensive lineman or any linebacker in the first couple rounds it, or an interior, I, I still am saying they need to get a really good interior offensive lineman. You know, if, if Bushrod is our one of the starting guards, great, but I want somebody to compete with him that can take his place if he gets hurt. And that's not, you know, a Dallas Thomas caliber player, but another really good interior lineman. And so any of those guys in the draft would be nice. So they're going to have to address at least one or two of those positions in free agency as well. And so it'll, it'll probably come down to, can they get a decent defensive end in free agency? Can they get a decent 
linemen in free agency. I, I don't think they're going to get the linebacker that they need in free agency. I think they're going to have to just hunker down and they're going to have to get some speed and some talent linebacker in the draft. I think that's the only way to do it. Oh, by the way, since you brought him up, did you know that the Eagles signed Dallas Thomas? Yeah, well, good, good for them. He, <laughs> I mean, I'm just, you know what? You guys were talking about the season, and that that's why this team made the playoffs. It wasn't because this is true. Other than Adam Gase made changes, and you know what? He he did something Philbin would not do, and he just said, you know what? Dallas Thomas is is not getting it done. He's gone, and Billy Turner is not getting it done. He's gone. You know what? If you aren't going to show up do the job that I expect you to do, you are not going to play for this football team. And he set that tone immediately, you know, in his coaching career. And like it or not, players respond to that. You know, they realize like, hey, if I get beat on this play, I'm going to be looking for work. And so that's that's the precedent you got to set, that you, you just cannot accept players to play subpar. And he pretty much laid it out there and he said, hey, look, I don't care about 40 times and how much you can bench press. If you can't show up and know what you're supposed to do, you're gone. I'll take somebody that's less talented, but at least they know what they're supposed to do and they're giving me everything they have. That's a really, really, really good point. <laughs> the, 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 the immediately after the purge, actually, is when the Dolphins woke up and started playing. <laughs> I wonder if that's actually part of the culture change. They got rid of, they drained the last of the Philbinites, I guess you could say. <laughs> Drain the swamp. No, I'm just kidding. Drain, I mean, Sorry. hey, in this case, in this case, it's relevant. In the football sense. Uh, That's not an inaccurate statement right now. <laughs> they, they drained the swamp of the Philbin curse. And poof, pretty- everything worked. It, it, they responded, that's for sure. So, that, that, And that's the difference between making the playoffs and not making the playoffs because all these games, it was all about character and, and having to play that last five, ten minutes and not just play 50 minutes. And, and that was a difference in a lot of those games. So oh, I'm excited because I really don't think the Dolphins had, from a talent personnel standpoint, a team that was much better than anything they've had the last decade. I mean, they just – they had plenty of issues and injuries mounted on top of that. And I'm excited to see what if they can actually get Adam Gase some players, you know, what if they can get him a really talented tight end? What can he do with that? Because he, he was beating teams with Marquise gray off the street. He was, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. He, and so maybe what if you get him another really good offensive lineman and get him a really good tight end suddenly like that could be another 10 to 15 points a game. And, uh, so it's exciting, uh, more than anything to feel like we finally got a coach that that can win with whatever you give him and here's another thing to think about maybe but because remember this think about this for a second when charles clay joined the dolphins and he started showing up and becoming a player i don't think anybody really saw it coming what if marquise gray is the new charles clay I, th- I like Marquise Gray, but I'm just saying I, I think what – in looking at what uh, Adam Gase has done over his career, I'm expecting him to get a big, like height-wise, a guy that's like 6'4", at least, 6'5", or taller, a uh, guy that can run pretty fast and is a, a, a big, talented tight end. I, it, and he's going to want to get that guy to stretch the middle of the field because – as good as Marquise Gray is, he, he ran some really good routes getting open out there in the flats and stuff like that. He is not a guy that you can send down the middle of the field that just scares defenses to be like, oh, my God, we got to follow this guy because if we let him down the field one-on-one, they're just going to chuck it up to him. Mm. And I Adam Gase wants that football player. He's had that through his career. And one way or another, they're going to get him that type of a, a tight end. He just – when he got here, he just didn't – they didn't – had too many holes. And so they had – Jordan Cameron, you know, and, and they just weren't quite sure what to do yet at the tight end position. But right now, you know, Deion Sims is a free agent and Marquise Gray is just a minimum paid player. So they're, they're going to add a tight end that, that's that way, one way or other. I don't know if they'll draft him or bring him in through free agency, but I, knowing Adam Gase, he'll, he'll get that for sure. Yeah. So we all agree that defense needs to have a high priority this off season one way or another, whether there's, whether it's in free agency or the draft, it's like, we cannot let the linebacker core be as miserable as it has been. We cannot let the defensive ends continue to deteriorate and come to think of it. As long as I'm bringing up defensive ends, here's another name that we have been pretty much completely ignoring this whole way through Andre branch. Yeah. 
Yeah, he's probably a top five defensive end, uh, free agent defensive end this offseason. They, they really need to re-sign him. Uh, we're just going to be too thin at that position if we don't. They just really have to, and they need to. I'd love to see that first-round pick be a, a good defensive end on top of it. I'd like to see him do both because we just don't know how much longer Cam Wake has. I know we keep saying it, but – yeah, I'm yeah. for when the day it actually Yeah, happens. you know, you know what, Ron, I'm just going to be like, look, whatever it happens, it happens. There's no way we're ever going to know ahead of time. Like Cam would have to say, this is my last year and then Miami can start preparing because until that happens, I'm going to be like, Cam, just you do you, bro. You do you. Yeah, but yeah, you just got to prepare for it. Oh, go ahead, Chad. I'm sorry. No, no, I, I was just agreeing with you. I, I feel like they can roll the dice a little bit more. Not a lot. They definitely need a de- defensive end, but – you can if you bring Andre Branch back, you can start Branch and Wake at, at DNs, and I think they still need some bigger DNs as well that you know, maybe a little more run stout. But with that being said, uh, they can probably make it through, assuming Cam Wake uh, is able to play through next year, which I have no doubts with the physical condition he keeps himself in. They what they have to get are the linebackers first because they uh, other than Alonzo they just don't have the talent at the linebacker position and so uh, I think they're going to have to focus on that so I mean I I if they get a guy that can play linebacker and DM both you know maybe a, a 250 pound 260 pound strong side guy that can really rush the passer from the DN position but can also play uh, linebacker like you know, somebody that talented like Deion Jordan, but not Deion Jordan, <laughs> but somebody like that would be ideal for him. But uh, they've got to get that player. Whereas you can probably go and say, well, if we re-sign Cam Wake, if we bring in another reasonably priced veteran and, and we keep those guys, we still have a fair defensive end um, rotation to work with, but they just don't have their starting linebacker core. And so uh, I, I can't see how they can't draft that high right now. But Because I, I guess I haven't really reviewed the free agents, but I don't know who they could bring in from a, a linebacker standpoint that's a free agent that, that could do the job. Donta Hightower is going to be on the open market, assuming <laughs> New England doesn't grab him. Jamie Collins. Nope. If, resigned no, with they, Cleveland already. Resigned already? Damn it. That yeah, I thought he was resigning. I, I would have liked to get Collins, but I thought he was going to resign with Cleveland. So He'll regret that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, maybe there, there, there'll be a lot of young players, but you will see. But we we all are in agreement. They've got on the front side of that defense. They've got to get some help with the linebackers and defensive line. And and it wouldn't break my heart at all to see them take like the first three rounds all in the front of the defense. All oh linebackers. yeah, front front so seven like, the whole way. I agree. Yeah. Front front seven the whole way. That's the, uh, the we don't Miami doesn't really need help in the sec. I mean, yes they do, but they don't. Okay. The secondary, for the most part, is set. You have Tony Lippett, who is still developing, and uh, Matthew Knowles, our film guy, did a fantastic review on him and showed everything that he did right, everything he did wrong, and I think the right outweighed the wrong for Lippett. Maybe he just needs to get a little more physical with tackling, but that's that, that counts for the entirety of the Miami Dolphins roster. So um, – you still Rashad's going to be back, and I am not going to assume that he's just going to stay hurt. I think maybe I'm, – I'm wondering if Adam Gase actually jumped the gun on putting him on injured reserve. So he'll, he'll be back, and he'll be doing well. I saw Abdul Kaddus. He did pretty well. He wasn't a superstar. He was about on the same level as Louis Delmas, in my opinion, which kind of hurts my heart a little bit because you know I love me Louis Delmas. He's a very, very nice man, and I love him. And uh, I hope he's doing well wherever he is. So – I can live with a Abdul Kadus Rashad Jones starting tandem safeties if unless you want to grab a superstar in the draft like somebody was um God I can't remember the kid's name but he's um all right were you about to tell me who it was Ron no I have not even really I, I just kind of look more as a free agency at this point I haven't really stared hard at the draft I I just know what position oh Desmond really King that was after. his name that was his name Desmond King. That, you guys, you guys like Desmond? I mean, I know him pretty well. <laughs> do you know Desmond King, Chad? Yeah, I'm from Iowa, man. So I've I've watched him his whole career. So okay, so tell us about him. Is he worth first round pick and removing Isa Abdul Kadus and putting him next to Rashad? Uh, well, he played corner his whole college career. Keep in mind, he's he's not a safety. Um, but that's where they're projecting him to move. Yeah, they're projecting there. He's. Uh, incredibly instinctual instinct got his very good instincts um i think his junior year at iowa he had like eight interceptions or nine interceptions or something like that um so he, he plays the ball very well um i think 
the the jury on Desmond King's going to be what his combine looks like because uh, the the knock on him is he is how fast is he? And that's probably why they're projecting him at safety because I don't think he's going to have that super forty time that you would want at a corner. And so you know, speed is speed in the NFL. So. I think we'll just have to wait and see. Um, I, I can tell you, though, he's got a solid head on his shoulder, and he's a, he's a very instinctual football player, and it wouldn't break my heart at all. And I don't know what the medical is on Caduce. I know he hurt his neck, but I haven't heard that he's for sure going to be cleared to play next year anyway. And so I, I'm a little nervous on what Caduce, where he's at health-wise. If Caduce is back to 100% and Rashad Jones is back to 100%, I'm not looking at safety other than a uh, a guy that has the talent that's probably raw, maybe in the middle of the draft. I, I think those would be your, your two starters set. And Michael Thomas always gives you that guy that he's never going to be a dominant safety, but he can give you a, a safety you can put on the field at any time that just doesn't get exploited. So he I, is going to be an unrestricted free agent for the first time in his career, Michael Thomas. That's actually another oh, so person gotta, we have to look at. So tough call there because he's never going to be – he's a lot like a guy before the show started. We were talking about Spencer Paysinger where he's never going to be a dominant starting player, but he can do so much for the team on special teams and can do so many different positions. He's got a lot of value on your 53-man roster. So I, I really hope they keep Michael Thomas. Not to mention he's something of a folk hero, so there is that. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. But I, I, knowing Michael Thomas, unless the Dolphins really try to go cheap on him, he, I think he probably would want to stay with Miami. He's really in community involved, and he's been here for a while. He's mm-hmm. a, a, a fan favorite. So I don't know why Michael Thomas would want to leave Miami. He probably doesn't. Well, hopefully he'll stick around. I personally like Michael Thomas. His family is very nice, very cute little girl. So I'm – there's a lot of stuff that Miami needs to look out for, and this is, and now we have to go into the, the whole draft discussion here. The Miami Dolphins have to look at the draft, and they're going to have to make some decisions. Now, depending on what they do in free agency, which I am not expecting much because of the mentality of resign your own, which sucks up a lot of uh, cap space, this opens up the discussion do you take the best player available in the draft, regardless of where he is or what position he plays? Or do you play the need game, which is what I would do, considering that Miami has a lot of needs, like a lot of needs. They have needs at linebacker. They have needs at defensive end. They have needs all over the board. It's just not a good situation for Miami to take the luxury pick because this is the argument that I made with with a lot of people over the whole best player available thing. If you take a player who is the best player, but he's a wide receiver, and we just spent all this time re-signing Jarvis, re-signing Stills, re-sign, um, we have still have Parker and Carew and Grant and all these guys who are talented, but the best player available is a wide receiver. I mean, you might get something out of him. You'll probably be able to use this wide receiver, but you still have this incredibly glaring hole in the middle of the defense and this and back on the front on the front four you still have this huge hole that still needs to be filled now the other option is you can take a player who's not quite as talented but he'd still fill that hole you have now what's more important for a team that could be very well on the cusp of being a playoff caliber football team? Do you fill that hole or do you just take the best talented player and let the hole stay in favor of a better talented player? My mentality is you fill that need because you know what your weakness is and signing and drafting this player regardless of whether he's the best on the board or not will fill that hole. That's just my thought process on the whole thing. Is like you need to fill your, you need to fix your weaknesses before you can work on upgrading what's already a strength. Yeah, I think it 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 to play on where you have people graded for the draft and and, and the positions do matter. I think uh, if it were wide receiver, no. I mean, it, and, unless they don't get stills resigned and, and Landry is a big question mark, then maybe they feel like they need to get a receiver in there, but. I, assuming that doesn't happen, uh, it, it'd have to be a, a huge gap. Like the receiver would have to absolutely be like, oh, we got like Calvin Johnson sitting here. And, you know, even though we don't need him, you know, if we're back this far in the draft, we're going to take him because he's obviously a stud. But I assuming that's not the case, uh, where, where it gets a little more tricky would be if um, you just don't have a linebacker that 
projects is somebody that's going to start for your team. And so you, you can take the best one on the board, but you just don't feel like he's going to come in and, and be an impactful player. But what if they, there is a safety on the board that's very good that you feel really good about? Uh, I think you got to go get the player you know is going to be a starting caliber, good football player, and you can't just plug the guy in who's going to be mediocre just because it's a bigger need. So I kind of throw it in there. So some of the positions I, I wouldn't be shocked that I wouldn't classify as desperate need positions, but it wouldn't shock me that they would take them would be um, a defensive tackle. I, I don't think they're desperately needing a defensive tackle, but if you have a really good one in the draft and you don't have that D Andrew linebacker rated there, I, I wouldn't be upset if they took a really good D tackle. Um, Maybe uh, on the other side of the ball, obviously tight end. Uh, when you start getting into the back end of the first round where the Dolphins are picking, if you don't, again, if you just don't have that linebacker that you really feel good about, but there's a, a tight end you really like, uh, you know, I, I don't have a problem pulling the trigger, but in terms of a position where they absolutely just don't need the help, um, more than likely you, you would want to trade out of that pick then and try to get the value for it. But this, just like it's been the last few years, the draft in the first round in particular, it's going to be all about these quarterbacks again. And so uh, it's kind of nice to, you know, like, especially with how, what Matt Moore did at the end of this year, I, you have to feel pretty good about coming into next year with Tannehill and, and Matt Moore. And, you know, if you had a stud quarterback fall to you, you know, maybe you take them. Um, to compete with with Dowdy, but for what Miami has right now, they don't have to worry about that. And these teams right now, like the New York Jets and, and the Cleveland Browns and the Buffalo Bills, uh, maybe even the Denver Broncos, some of these teams, they've got to be trying to maneuver around this draft to get a quarterback because you really can't go into a year, not just from a competitive standpoint, but just from your fan base standpoint. I mean, can the Cleveland Browns this year – really afford to go in this year and not get what would be probably considered the best quarterback in the draft. I mean, they just, I think they want Tyrod Taylor and Garoppolo. I'm just saying, I, man, it, it's hard to keep fans in the seat when you keep doing that stuff. I mean, they have got to get their quarterback. And so and sort of these other teams and the teams are going to have to overpay, if you will, in draft picks to get those guys. And, and we saw that exact thing happen this year. Look at the moves to get up to the top two quarterbacks this year, uh, you know, from the Eagles and Rams. I mean, they just threw out the picks to get up there. And, and I think you're going to see the same thing again because these teams, obviously the Browns will be able to pick whoever they want. But if you are a team like the Jets or the Bills and, and you don't really have your guy, can you? how can you afford not to move up and get your quarterback? Because – you know, if you just don't have good quarterback play, you know, as we saw for years with the Dolphins, you just can't get anywhere. It's it's hard to get over mediocre ever if you don't have good quarterbacks. And so that's going to dictate where guys fall in the draft because that's the position. I mean, usually you can look at an offensive lineman or a defensive lineman and you can almost pretty well grade him and know where they're going to fall after all the draft analysis comes in. You know what the top offensive linemen are. You know what the top defensive linemen is. And you can't maybe say they're going to go on this pick, but you know they're going to be in the top 10. They're going to be in the top 20. They're going to be in the top 30. And those guys go there because that's just obviously what they are. I mean, alignment is alignment when it comes to talent, how quick they are, how they are on their feet, how they are in film. But quarterback's the mystery pick because you have no idea who's going to make it and who's not, and teams are desperate for them. And that's the one that throws the draft all, all amok because a team may go up and move if they're scared that they're not going to get their guy. And that's what makes people slide. And so this is a year just like last year. What I'm hoping is that the hype is, hype is real. I mean, if for the Dolphins' sake, I want those quarterbacks that are going to be the top three or four in the draft that rated quarterbacks, I want the hype on them to be huge because I want teams making sure they're moving up big time to get them so that some quality players drop back to Miami. All right, so let's let's make this question. And I'm going to ask you both what position, because for me, the biggest need Miami has is linebacker bar none. The yes. wide nine doesn't work without linebackers. And Miami has none besides Kiko, who, whether he's in the middle or outside is the best we've got. And a lot of people are not happy with the fact that he's the best we've got. So here's the question that I pose to you both. What positions would you be okay with Miami taking in the first round other than a stud linebacker if he's there? Um. I'm okay with them taking just about any position, and I've always been okay with them taking just about any position in the first round because this is 
this is where you're you're going to get your really good starting talent, and you can always use that just about anywhere on your team. The, There's the, no positions you wouldn't be okay with. Well, I, w- I wouldn't be happy if they took a quarterback in the first round. I mean, that wouldn't make sense. But but mostly, or a wide receiver, I would hope not, unless it's like what uh, Chad said, like Calvin Johnson. But beyond that, I'd be okay with just about any position. What, what I think the problem that the Dolphins have put themselves into the reason they have such a giant hole at linebacker isn't because they, if I remember correctly, passed on Ryan Shazier, isn't because they just missed out on C.J. Mosley. It's because they have literally drafted like one linebacker in four years, even to try and develop like a third rounder, a fourth rounder, a fifth round. They keep passing and passing. And we saw all these linebackers last year. They kept passing and passing and passing. They've done that, and they keep on signing undrafted free agents. And that's why they put themselves in such a hole. So do what you want to do in the first round, but you better draft some linebackers in this draft. You can't keep doing this over and over again every year and just trying to band-aid it. I mean, that's why they put themselves in such a bad position at linebacker. If they at least had been, you know, spending some maybe second, third, fourth, even fifth rounders on guys, more than one. I think they've done it once in three or four years. I don't remember the guy's name. He came from a real small school. He was on the team like a year, and he, I think he was cut after the second offseason. I can't even remember his name. But um, th- that's the reason they're in the situation they're in right now. So do what you want to do in the first round and grab your talent. But somewhere in this draft, you need to start drafting some linebackers to at least develop, even if they're not starters from day one, or you're always going to be in this situation, or you're going to have to try and spend big money on a free agent, which really hasn't even been available to us in the few that have been available over the last four or five years we've kept missing on. Uh, yeah, with, with that, Lewis, I, two positions I could see, um, yeah, linebacker, I 100% agree is the number one need, but um, I would say if they draft a, a really talented D tackle, I would be okay with it because I, if they brought a guy in that was just a stud D tackle, really difficult to, to block, um, you pair him with an Adama and Sue, and that changes the whole face of what your defense can do. It, it becomes so difficult to defend the Miami's front when you've got two really good D tackles in there. If suddenly, if you can't double team Sue all the time, that really makes it hard to do anything that's in the middle of the field. And so I could see them doing that. And I also still say they need a very good interior offensive lineman. And and maybe they can find that in free agency. I haven't looked at what's going to be available on the offensive side on the line for free agency, but they need that Laramie Tunsil type player inside that can be the guard. I I would love a guard that could play center or guard, but um, I, you know, I don't think uh, they have that guard on the team yet. That's going to be that guy that's playing guard for him for the next 10 years. And so it wouldn't make me upset if, you know, that talented player is there at the end of the first round and they grab him knowing they're going to need him um, and they just go there and get it taken care of. And, and, and like Ron said, they got to address the linebacking position. But if the, if the stud guy is not there, he's not there. And you take what you can then, um, you know, in the following two, three, four rounds to fill your linebacker spot. So you don't want to like overreach for a linebacker who's just kind of going to be a decent linebacker over a stud pro bowl caliber interior lineman so that's either side of the ball if they take a a line tackle or guard i would would be completely fine with it in the first round and the positions you would not be okay with uh for sure receiver i i just again this is assuming that that they re-sign kenny stills if if they re- it went for another receiver, I'd be surprised. And I don't know where Carew is going to end up. He's so far is appearing to be a disappointment because for what they gave up to get him, he I expected him to be taking still spot this year when when at the end of the draft last year I thought oh they they're picking up Carew because they really like him. He looks like a big physical type of receiver that can also block. And I thought he's going to come in and he'll be looking like the number three receiver next year, and, and Stills is, isn't even comparable. It Stills is such a better player right now that they, they're going to have to uh, do that. But I don't see the need for them to go get yet another receiver after they just invested in Carew and, and the number of picks. And so I, that would disappoint me quite a bit. Um, I don't think they need to go get a corner. He, it'd have to be a really good-looking special type guy, which he, the, the, those blue-chip elite corners are all gone the first 10 to 15 picks anyway. So I don't see one just falling to the Dolphins. It's special, and I don't see them 
being able to give up extra picks to move up to get a corner. And so I, I thought Lippitt was, has done nothing but improve ever since he's been here. And he's just getting ready to, I think, be go from just being a guy to being a good corner. Um, I would keep Maxwell. I think he, he played well enough to keep him around. And um, assuming Xavier Howard is going to be healthy next year, and Bobby McCain has, has been playing adequately in the slot, I don't see them needing to go out and, and, and invest a high draft pick in a corner either. All right, then. So um, I think we've covered all the bases here, unless there's something that I missed. Do you think that it, was there something that I, we should have talked about that we didn't yet? I think we got it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it feels like we have. We've been going for like an hour and a half now, so I think we have pretty much nailed everything on the head here. We've discussed off-season plans. We've discussed what Miami should do, what they definitely should not do. I think think we're about good here guys um unless there's any final thoughts you guys want to bring up nope it's gonna be fun um look to the off season so i uh, oh, do you guys know the dates off the top of your head i know isn't it sometime in early to mid-march when free agency opens up it's usually like around 7th 8th of march something like that somewhere so. in there That'll be the next big date after the super bowl to keep your eyes on um oh the super bowl ah, that's something I don't want to talk uh, about the Super Bowl. <laughs> I'll pass on that. Go Falcons. <laughs> Go Falcons. Yeah. Go Falcons. That's all I got to say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, then. Well, I guess we'll just go ahead and call it a night, then. We talked about a lot of stuff, and it's going to be really interesting to see what the Dolphins do. One thing that I know for sure is is that defense must be a priority. Whatever Gates does, defense must fix, must be done. That defense held us back all year long. Could you imagine if we had a good defense this season? We managed to get to 10-6 and six with a defense that gave up that was ranked 30th in the league in rush yards allowed. Think about that for a second. Rush yards allowed, we were 30th, and we went 10-6. and six. Could you imagine if we had a defense that was able to stop the run? Oh, my God. <laughs> Just the very thought of it is kind of making, my, uh, it's kind of making goosebumps appear in my arms. Yeah, we're going to see what happens, see what uh, they can pull off. All right, then. So um, thank you all so much for joining us. It's been a great show, and uh, we'll try to be back uh, as soon as things start to pick up again in the off season. if we don't do one earlier. So thank you all so much for joining us. You can listen on our YouTube channel, and you can watch on this list, and you can also listen on iTunes, Stitcher, and our SoundCloud. And thank you all so much for joining us once more, and we'll see you all next time for another episode of the FinManiacs.com podcast.